as we pick up our study this morning, we're down to one day in the life of Jesus. There's just hours remaining before Jesus is going to be betrayed, murdered, buried, um, and all this evil stuff is going to happen in Jesus' life. And so for the next few months, um, as we study John, we're basically going to be studying a day and a half in the life of Jesus. But John is going to go hour by hour, minute by minute, um, into the life of Jesus as he heads into the cross. And John wants us to intentionally look closely at the last days of Jesus. And what we discover is that Jesus now withdraws from the crowd, and he transitions from public life ministry, and in his last day, last day and a half, he's just investing into the life of his disciples. And he goes from public life to his private life, from those who reject him to those who have received him. And Jesus now, from now until the cross, spends time with only his disciples. And John tells us nothing more if he ever speaks to the crowds ever again. And in the next several chapters, we're going to discover that Jesus is going to teach us many, many things. Things about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the exclusivity of the cross, the need for us as his followers to stay close to Jesus, the hatred of the world toward us as followers of Jesus, the need to endure persecution, and how at the end of this, Jesus is going to conquer the world. And it starts at the Passover meal in a room just with his disciples. It's the last meal that Jesus is going to eat till his resurrection when you see him by a fire eating fish with his disciples. And actually, he doesn't even begin by saying anything. He just simply does something. The first strokes of the, po or the portrait that John is painting on the last days of Jesus is not Jesus calming the sea. It's not Jesus casting out a demon. It's not Jesus raising the dead. It's not Jesus multiplying food. But the first portrait we see is Jesus on his knees in service to his disciples. That's the first thing we see. And you've got to ask the question, why? Why does Jesus take on the role of his servant here? Why is service so important that it's not just the first thing that Jesus teaches his disciples on their last night, but it's the first thing that Jesus does? And the reason is because Jesus is training his disciples so that he could send them out. And there is nothing more antithetical to our faith, to our nature, than grace-centered, selfless service. Serving is more caught than taught. I can stand up here and teach you over and over that you need to serve. Right? It's something that you have to catch. It's something that has to transform you. We are wired by our sin nature to serve self, and to look out only for ourselves. If we do serve, it is only in a patronage type of way, a way to get something in return. Martin Luther, when he was teaching on Romans and commenting on Augustine's definition of sin, he made this comment. He said, Our nature, by the corruption of the first sin, being so deeply curved in and of itself, that it only bends the best gifts of God towards itself. It even uses God himself in order to attain these gifts. It also fails to realize that it is so wickedly, curvedly, viciously seeks all things, even God, for their own sake. It's like every human being that ever walked on this planet is like this big, giant black hole, and we want to suck everything in for ourselves. That we're all attempting to bend everything toward ourselves. Just think about this. Place a dozen toddlers in a room with nothing else in it, right? Just keep put, put 12 kids in there. And then put a toy right in the middle of it, and then let these kids go. You are going to see Royal Rumble exploded, right? Um, there's going to be pacifiers being dropped, bottles being thrown, diaper wedgies, all sorts of stuff happening. Because these kids are only wanting things for themselves. From a young age, all we care about is what can we get for ourselves. And we do that by nature. You don't have to be taught that. It is natural. This is why Jesus not only taught on service right up front, but he also showed what it means to serve. And he's going to teach them many, many things on this last night, but this is how he begins with selfless service, grace-motivated service, and that's central to the mission that Jesus will send us on. Everything Jesus does from this point on is going to, is going to be summed up in John 20 where he says, as the Father sent me, 
so now I send you. Keep that in mind because you're going to see this bent in the disciples even around this table. Because as Jesus is getting ready to wash these disciples' feet, as Jesus is getting ready to prepare himself for death, the disciples, they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. They're sitting there arguing about, I'm the one who's going to be significant. I'm going to sit on the left side. I'm going to sit on the right side. They're, and Jesus looks at them and says, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And they begin to argue about who's the greatest. Their insecurity about the possibility that they could be it spurred on this argument. And so here they are, hours before Jesus is about to die, and the disciples are arguing who's the greatest. The black holes are bending toward themselves everywhere. You can imagine Bartholomew sitting there talking to Thomas like, you always doubt Jesus anyway, you're, it's going to be you. Right? And Simon Peter's over there um, yelling at Simon the Zealous like, you're just a patriot, you don't really care about Jesus, and you're, you're, you're not it. And there's Matthew telling Andrew, look, I know Matt, I know all this stuff, I'm a tax collector, you're a fisherman, you're insignificant, I'm going to be used by God, you're going to betray Jesus. But notice how Jesus responds in Luke 22. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest and the leader as one who serves. Jesus is saying, listen, you've seen how the world operates. You've seen how kings and rulers operate, but that's not the way it's going to be in my kingdom. You've seen how everyone else is all about themselves. It's about people that you know. It's about having power over people's lives and having enough money to satisfy your every desire. But listen, my kingdom is about service and submission. Instead of being a black hole where you drain everything in towards yourself, I'm going to transform you into being stars and not American Idol stars or Hollywood stars, but I'm going to make you like the sun that gives warmth and light to people around you. And that's what he's going to demonstrate to his disciples and for us this morning in our text. And he's going to call us to a life of selfless service. He's going to call you to make a difference in the lives of your brothers and sisters here at Lost City through serving them. And he's going to call you to take that attitude and collectively go and serve your town and your city and your world. Why? Because this is how the gospel goes forward. And this is the characteristic of every follower of Jesus. Listen, can I be brutally honest with you for a second? If your life isn't characterized by selfless service to others, if you're just simply taking up space here every Sunday and not serving at all, if you're just hanging on the sidelines, watching everyone else in the game, but you're just sitting and leaving, you got to ask some honest questions of why. You have to ask, are you really pursuing Jesus? It is a selfless service, this embodying of a servant's posture that has caused the gospel to go forward for 2,000 years. Because Christianity was not founded by a strong person who took power, but it was founded by a strong person who gave up his power. It was founded by Jesus, who said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So how do we get this mindset? How do we get this attitude of a servant? We're going to discover that in the life of Jesus. And four things I want you to see from this text. Number one, the first thing that we need is a humble heart. A humble heart. Humility is where service begins. A proud person doesn't serve, and if they do serve, it is only for their own self-interest. The world has people that serve and give and share their power, but it's mostly rooted in pride and for self-advancement or accolades or attention or applause. What the world hasn't seen is a group of people who serve in humility, who truly look out for the interests of those not just in their tribe, but also people who are not in their tribe. Look at verse 1 of John 13. It says, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew the hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Why does Jesus tell us what he's thinking? 
Why does Jesus communicate to us what's going on in his mind? I think it's to illustrate to us his humility. He serves despite the upcoming cross, despite the lack of return that he gets from the disciples, despite the fact that he didn't need to serve at all. He didn't need to. Jesus knew that just was, death was just around the corner. He knew the cross was calling his name. He knew that the weight of sin of his disciples and your sin and my sin was going to be placed on him in just a few hours. He knew the Father was about to turn his back on him, and yet he loved his own. Literally, he loved them to, their, to his last dying breath. There are many examples of people in our lives, friends, family, spouse, parents, who abandon the family when life gets hard, but Jesus doesn't do that with us. He serves you while the cross casts a shadow over his life. Look at verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You know, Satan wasn't idle during this time. In Luke 4, it tells us that Satan left Jesus after the temptations only to return at an opportune time. And this was that time. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew it was like Judas was the one that was going to hold the knife, that was going to stab Jesus in the back. He knew that he had arranged a deal with the religious leaders for money to turn Jesus over to him, and yet Jesus still loved him. In fact, Jesus would wash the feet of Judas. So many times, you and I, we will only serve if people have been nice to us. We will only serve if they can serve us back in some way. We will only serve if we can get something in return. Maybe you will consider helping out in church or somewhere else, and you realize that, hey, I don't get anything in return for this. I'm sp spending all my time or energy, and I don't get any recognition, and you're like, oh, I've got better things to do. But can I ask you, what did Jesus get from serving Judas? What did he get from that? He didn't get any perks. He didn't get any benefits. He didn't get any money. Judas was actually stealing Jesus' money. What did he get? He got arrested because of Judas. He got slandered because of Jesus. He got Judas. He got ridiculed and mocked and murdered all because of Judas. And the amazing thing is Jesus knew that was going to happen. And yet he still served anyway. You know, it's so sad and heartbreaking when people get upset about decisions that are made at church, not here, because you guys are good, um, but all of a sudden, you start withdrawing, and you stop doing stuff, and you don't serve anymore because someone hurt you or someone offended you, and you stop giving, and you stop serving, or one day you just stop coming. Few things are less gospel-centered, less glorifying to Jesus than that kind of attitude. You are no different than the disciples at the table arguing about who's the greatest. What can I get out of this? And meanwhile, Jesus is looking at us and saying, this is what I died for? Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, was going back to God. You and I read that and you're like, well, that's obvious. Jesus knew he was the sovereign king. He wasn't just a good man, a good teacher, or a miracle worker. He was and is God. The religious leaders had already tried to kill Jesus because he claimed to be a God in John 8. And he would have said it again in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they would all fall down when Jesus says, I am, basically implying that he's God. Why does that matter? Here's why. Because Jesus could have stopped all of this. He could have stopped Judas in his tracks. He could have defeated all the guards that came to arrest him. He could have came down from the cross on his own, but he did it. Even here, he could have snapped his fingers, and angels could have popped down with water and a wash basin, and the angels could have washed the, feet of the disciples. He didn't have to lift a finger if he didn't want to. But he did so because he was humble. Acts 17 says, Nor is he served by human hands, as though if he needed anything since he himself gave to all mankind life and breath and everything. My friends, the only way, the only way you and I will ever begin to lift our fingers and serve others, the only way you and I will ever give a thought to serving people that you don't know, the only way you would consider serving the lost and broken is when you see a Savior who didn't need anything from you 
but gave everything for you. That's the only way you will ever love and serve genuinely is when you see a Savior who didn't need you, and yet he gave his life for you. You have to see that the one who had every right to not pursue you, every right not to invade your life, every right not to save you, every right to leave you on a pathway to hell, but he did come after you. He did hang on that tree for you. He did bleed for you. He did die for you. He did resurrect for you. And he is now interceding for you day in and day out. That's the only way you will see you will ever serve. This will cause you to look around. It will cause you to leave your pity party and do some good in your world. Your life will stop being about you and your problems and your kingdom and instead would be about injustices that are going on, the needs of others, and the kingdom of Jesus bringing light into this world. See, so many of us look around and see needs and say, someone else will do it. And Jesus looks around and sees a need that someone else should have done, but Jesus says, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he right says it this way, shaping our world is never for a Christian a matter of going out arrogantly thinking that we can just get on with our job, recognizing the world according to some model that we have in mind. It's a matter of sharing and bearing the pain and puzzlement of the world so that the crucified love of God in Christ may be brought to bear healing upon the world at exactly that point. Because as he himself said, following him Following him involves taking up the cross. We should expect, as the New Testament tells us repeatedly, that to build on his foundation will be to find the cross etched into the pattern of our life and work over and over again. You need a humble heart. Number two, you need lowly sacrifice. So here's John painting this picture for us, showing us Jesus' every move, every thought. And Jesus is reclining at this U-shaped table quietly observing the disciples. And as you glance around the room, picture this room with me. You see this bewildered bunch, mostly clueless that Jesus is going to die in just a few hours, that he's going to be betrayed. They have no idea. They're not getting it. And it's possibly that the argument for who was the greatest had already started. They're arguing. They're talking. And you see bony fingers pointing at each other in the room and accusing each other. You hear the pounding of fists at the table as they're arguing in disgust. And then you look over at this wall on the side and there's this apron and you, there's a towel that's hanging there. And beneath that towel is a water pitcher and wa there's a water pitcher and a wash basin. And all you, everyone can see it, but no one pays mind to it because they were all consumed with their own agendas. And you say, what's the big deal with foot washing? See, in ancient times, the washing of the feet before a meal was necessary because there was no pavement or cement but only dirt roads to walk on and the roads were inches deep in dust during dry spells and inches deep in mud during rainy season and not only did the animals walk on these trails but they also left little surprises on the road and these weren't like little mints that you get in a hotel bed or something and when they and when the disciples would eat they would lay on their side so that their face that their feet was near the face of the next person. So this service was performed by the lowliest of slaves. As a matter of fact, Jews said that Jewish slaves did not have to do this, only non-Jew slaves. These were given to Gentile slaves. The disciples apparently thought that a slave was going to show up, and maybe even one of the younger disciples, the least insignificant one, would wash their feet. But look what Jesus does. He gets up with calmness and majesty. He removes his outer garment and he takes off his inner garment, leaving him with just a loincloth around him, no shirt. That was the outfit of a slave in that day. Jesus looks like a slave for the moment. And then he ties a long towel around his waist, which was used to dry the feet of the disciples. And he begins to wash their feet. And the idea was that he washed every single one of their feet one by one. Can you imagine the reaction of the disciples at this moment? You could hear a pin drop in that room. All the arguing, all the finger pointing, all the pounding on the table had ceased, and every eye was on Jesus. They were dumbfounded. They were speechless. This was not something a leader would do. 
This was not something even a friend would do. This was something reserved for a Gentile slave. It would have been expected for Jesus to begin teaching or even leading in a song or continuing to expound on what the kingdom was or even just enjoying a meal together. But to wash the feet of disciples? Unthinkable. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet as well? The idea is that he came to Peter last. He had washed everyone else's feet. No one else talked up. And he comes to Peter, and basically Peter inserts his dirty foot into his own mouth. Typical Peter. He was the spokesman of the group and never delayed in sharing what was on his mind. His statement was, are you going to wash my feet? And you can imagine Peter pulling up his feet to his chest and saying, what are you doing? Did you forget who you were? You're supposed to be establishing a kingdom here. Listen, I can call servants up right now. They can do this. Shame on you other disciples for having Jesus wash your feet. The reality was Jesus could have done that. He could have called a servant to come up and wash them. But he was trying to teach them that if they really loved them, loved him, and they loved each other, they needed to serve each other in every way possible despite their disagreements. If they didn't get this lesson, the gospel would not go forward. They would have stayed huddled up in that room in Acts 1, and you and I wouldn't be here today. My friends, until the gospel changes our motives, you will never really believe the gospel. The gospel has to change our motives. The seed is still, until the gospel changes your motive, the seed is still on the ground. It hasn't gone into the soil. The penny of the gospel hasn't dropped. Verse 7. Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Jesus uses two different words for that word understand. He basically says, listen, Peter, you're not computing this right now, but one day when you see me on the cross, you will really understand what this is all about. Peter needed to learn, listen, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The foot washing was only a picture that the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus was going to do for them on the cross. Peter doesn't get it, but he will. Which is why we'll see a different Peter in Acts 2. We'll see a Peter that's transformed. Verse 8, Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. The language is as strong as it can possibly be. Peter uses a double negative. Never, no, in all eternity, never. I will never allow you to wash my feet. Are you crazy? Give me back my feet. That's basically what Peter's saying. Verse continued. Jesus answered him, If I don't wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Just give me a bath, Jesus. Um... The last thing that Peter wanted was not to be a part of Jesus. As foolish and loose-lipped as Peter was, you could see here that Peter wanted Jesus more than anything else. That's admirable. And that's encouraging because as foolish and loose-lipped and sinful as we are, if we keep pursuing Jesus, Jesus can use us. He wanted Jesus more than anything which is why Peter thinks that if Jesus can wash his feet, makes him a part of Jesus, then he wants to be consumed with Jesus. It's like thinking, hey, if 10 bucks can get me into the nosebleed section of the stadium, then I wonder how much $300 would get me, right? And that's what Peter's saying. Like, give me all that I can get for my money. And you can see Peter starting to get undressed, and the disciples are like, wait, stop it, Peter, we're leaving, right? And that's, that's the image right there, verse 10. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Jesus uses the plural meaning of all the disciples except Judas was clean. They are part of Jesus. They're part with Jesus. Listen, when you come to Jesus, you don't get a partial access to him. You get full access. You get full access to the throne room of God. All of your sin has been washed away. And what was used to be red like crimson has been made white as snow. And yet, even though we're completely clean, you and I, we still need to confess our sin for our own sake. 
Which is why I believe Jesus says by washing the feet, God doesn't treat us as if we're still sinners that need to repent and get saved again. But confession is good for us. It helps us be dependent on Jesus. It helps us realize that Jesus, without you, we'll, we'll continue to screw up. And sometimes there's some of you in this room that say, hey, I've been praying for a long time for Jesus to deliver me from this bondage. And he has it. And I sit there and I'm like, man, Jesus is using this bondage to cause you to pray. Did you capture that? You're praying to Jesus in bondage. Praise God for that. Because if Jesus delivers you, praise God. But in the midst of your struggles, you're drawing to Jesus and saying, Jesus, help. Praise God for that. If your sin drives you toward Jesus, what a great thing. I'm not saying your sin is a great thing, but the fact that you're drawn to Jesus is incredible. Keep pursuing Jesus. Confession forces us to keep looking at the cross and see what our sin did. It means to say the same old thing as to say that God sees it. Jesus could simply say, oh, don't worry about it. You're already forgiven, but he doesn't say that. Because in confessing, we continue to marvel at the cross and grow in our love for Jesus as we realize our sin and go back to the cross over and over. Our appreciation and love for the cross only shines in the black velvet backdrop of our sin. So here's the lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples as his followers, we not only need to be characterized by a humble heart, but also sacrificial service. Do you think the washing of his disciples' feet was enjoyable for Jesus? Probably not. Jesus humbled himself in becoming a man, even more so in becoming a servant, the most in becoming a sacrifice for you and me. Serving and seeing the gospel go forward will always involve sacrifice. You'll lose sleep. You'll lose money. You'll lose some free time. That's what sacrifice means, but in the end you will gain so much more. Joyful sacrifice. Number three, submissive joy. Submissive joy. Submissive joy sounds very contrary to, contradictory to our modern years. How can submission be joyful? And Jesus now begins to explain what he has done and its significance. He calls them to submit to him and yet know that it is for their greatest good. Jesus stands up from the water basin and he picks up his robe, he puts it back on and he ties it back. And meanwhile, the disciples are watching all of this in utter shock. And they have seen Jesus do so many miracles, but they never expected Jesus to do this. Verse 12. When he had washed their feet, put on his our garments, resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done? And here's now Jesus reclining at the tables, and the uh, the, reclining at the table, and the disciples are on the edge of their seat, wondering what Jesus is going to say. And he knows what they're thinking, and it's not computing yet what Jesus had done. And the question is circling in their minds, like a plane that's flying around, not finding a landing strip. And can you imagine the disciples? Everyone just stares into space. Some are scratching their heads. And Peter probably thinks, well, at least I tried to say something. And they're all confused. And Jesus affirms their right theology, but their theology wasn't the problem. It was acting on that theology. If you could have stopped for a moment and just talked to Matthew and asked him about power and sovereignty and the justice of God, he could have given you a dissertation. He could have told you all the right things you needed to hear. He could have quoted theology left and right to you. He would have said that God is the almighty God, but he doesn't need to do things like wash feet. He's got bigger fish to fry. Theology is important, but unless it gets to you to your hands and feet in service, it's worthless. You can know Scripture backward and forward. You can memorize a thousand verses. But if it doesn't transform how you live your life, man, it doesn't mean anything. Verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also have to wash one another's feet. 
And Jesus is setting up a contrast here. The greater to the lesser. He says, I, you guys know I'm God. You guys know that I'm the creator. If I have done this, then you have to as well. The principle is going beyond the simple washing of feet, but it's a symbolized lifestyle of service. Our MO has to be service because of how much we've been served by Jesus. We are to be gracious people because, we, because God has shown us grace in Jesus. We are to be merciful people because God has shown us mercy in Jesus. We are to be patient people because God has shown us patience in Jesus. And we are to serve one another and those in need inside and outside of this building because God has served us in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The word servants there used to refer to under rowers. They were men who would tug at the oars of the lowest bench of a ship. In ancient times, there were three levels of rowers. Those on the upper level who had the advantage of the fresh air. Those in the middle who were shut, more shut in. But the lowest rowers would pass out during the heat. Their rapid strokes consumed every ounce of energy that they possessed. They were chained to oars, and in the worst position doing the hardest work, many of them would die on the journey. And Jesus said, we are to be under rowers for Jesus. Verse 15. For I've given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done for you. Let's be honest here. Jesus never said, hey, we should sing like Jesus sang. He never said we should dance like David danced. He never said we should clap like David clapped or preach sermons like Jesus preached or attend church like he did. Jesus said we should serve like he served. Listen, our church would turn heads and grow as people, go grow in people as the world sees that we're not interested in advancing our own good, our own brand, our own name, our own story, but we're interested in the good of others. We're interested in doing good, not just for our own little internal tribe, but for our whole city. That's what's going to make a difference in our community. First Peter 2 says, For this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow his steps. First Peter 3, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, do this. Bless. For this, for to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. We are called to serve like Jesus, suffer like Jesus, bless like Jesus. Why? Because this is what he's done for us. But notice Peter says that we obtain a blessing when we do this which is what Jesus says here in verse 17. He says, if you know these things, John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As you look out for the good of people around you, God looks out for your good. As you care for people that God has placed in your life, God takes care of you. Our greatest joy is found in service, in giving of ourselves and blessing others with our time, our talent, our treasure. Our greatest misery is due to the fact that we are so focused on ourselves, focused so much on ourselves and spend so much on ourselves. You know this by experience. Our greatest heights of joy are those moments when we forget about ourselves, when we invest into the lives of people around us when we help the poor, the forgotten, when we're part of something that's so much bigger than just ourselves. Acts 20, and all these things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Isaiah 58, is this not the fast that I choose? Is this not Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? 
Then shall your light break forth like dawn if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted. Then shall your light rise in your darkness and your gloom as the noonday. Frederick Buchner said, Our calling is found where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Our calling is found where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger, they meet. Number four, missional mindset. Look at verse 18 to 20. He says, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Verse 19, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. It's a very interesting ending to this section. In verse 20, send and receive is written there six times in the original language. Jesus has been talking about the disciples serving one another, loving one another, and now he extends that service to all of us, to the overall mission. This is a foreshadowing of Acts, John 20, 21, where he says that, as the Father sent me, so I send you as well. And what Jesus is doing is telling us that the mission of the church is more than just evangelism, even though it's not less than that. We talk about two wings of the plane here, the mercy and mission. It's both. Jesus is telling his disciples that service, the most lowly of service, is part of the mission that he's sending us on. That we should be all about serving the church on mission and serving the mission of the church. See, the tendency of churches is to uphold service within the church as the only true service. We have to love one another and serve one another, but we also have to love and serve our town, our city, our community. Just like service within the Trinity overflows into service toward us, so our service toward, with one another is to overflow into serving a watching world. Listen, many of you, if you're not feeling guilty, you should feel guilty by now, right? And we should. But we can't end there. We have to find a greater motion, motivation than just guilt. Guilt will get you to do one thing like two times and you're, you're done. That's not the motivation. Religion will not set us on mission to serve. I gotta ask you, do you see the gospel in this text? Do you see that everything that Jesus is calling us to do in this text, he has already done for us. You need a humble heart to serve, but Jesus had the ultimate humble heart who gave up all to come down into the sin-sick world and live the life that you and I couldn't live. You and I, we need to make lowly sacrifices but Jesus made the lowly sacrifice. He went to the cross. He gave his life as a sacrifice for you and I. He paid for your sin. He died the death that you should have died. You need to have submissive joy. But Jesus joyfully submitted to the will of the Father. Even in the garden, he said, Yet, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Hebrew tells us that he didn't do this grudgingly, but he did this for the joy that was set before him. You need to have a missional mindset. But Jesus carried out that mission. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And when he died, he said, it is finished because he completed the mission. He served you and he served me to the uttermost. See, the oxymoron in this passage is that in order to serve Jesus, you have to see that Jesus has already completed the service. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn his acceptance and love and approval from him. You are completely clean by faith in him. Every other religion in this world will tell you that you, there are things that you need to do, things that you have to accomplish to be accepted, to be forgiven, in order for you to get to heaven. Think about Buddha's call to follow his eightfold path. But Jesus' call would say, follow me. Think of Buddha's last words was keep striving. But Jesus' last words was it is finished. Oh, the freedom to serve is so sweet when we know that it's finished. That we don't need 
to serve, to be forgiven, to be accepted, to be loved, to be approved. We already are free. We already are accepted. We already are approved. And so we can serve with absolute freedom. David Brainerd was a young man who died at the age of 29 of tuberculosis. He lived during the early 1700s and both his father and mother had passed away when he was very young. At age 21, he was saved and devoted the last years of his life to reaching Native Americans for Jesus. The three years before his death, he records how he rode miles upon miles, spitting out blood, could hardly think because of the pain, in cold sweats every night, violently coughing and fevered, no appetite, severe back and chest pains, without food sometimes. And when he did have food, it was bread that was moldy and sour. He was lost in the woods often, lonely, discouraged. And in the midst of all of that, he says, I was able yet to ride over to my people about two miles every day to take care of them. A year before his death, he made this statement. He said, oh, I long to fill the remaining moments of my life all for God. And even though my body is feeble and wearied with preaching and private conversation and sick, yet I want to sit up all night and do something for God. My soul is refreshed and comforted, and I could not but bless God who has enabled me in some good measure to be faithful in the day past. Oh, how sweet it is to be spent and worn out for God, for here we have no lasting city. John Piper, commenting on Brainerd's life, said, When you spend the last seven years of your life spitting up blood and you die at the age of 29, you don't just say those words, Here we have no lasting city. You feel it. You feel it the way you feel the wind on a cliff's edge. Oh, how many feel the wind and they run inland. Since we have no lasting city here, stop working so hard trying to make it lasting and luxurious and go forth to him outside the camp outside the safe place outside the comfortable place let go of what holds you back from full and radical service as we go to communion this morning this is an opportunity for you to respond to the gospel this is an opportunity for you to respond to the Holy Spirit in your own